Hey guys, don't mind the air conditioner sound in the background. We are doing a sheet melt today. I've just removed the cardstock that we put around the edges to keep, well, most of the uh, frit in. But you can see here, this is some cool looking, it is pale amber, amber and uh, clear on top of one of these panes of glass that came in our rack pack, that kind of bulk. Woo, all that glass over yonder. Uh, our bulk, uh, bulk order of sheet glass that we had done. Now the uh, amber and clear are both medium grit and the pale amber is fine. So let's see how this comes out looking um, after going through a full fuse. And it is the following morning. It's still quite hot. Ooh, that's, I don't know why it exploded in half, but <laughs> uh, this is how it's looking. I love the cell action that we have going on there. All right. Hey guys. So. We're gonna be filling this mold here that I've sprayed with four coats of zip boron nitride. Um, and we're gonna be chunking up some of this sheet melt that we had done that I'm really, really pleased with how the surface texture came out. But also if you check out this interesting banding from the sides. And so we're, I'm gonna try to stack it in a couple of different ways just to see um, what kind of effect we get whenever we fire it. So to chunk this up, I'm just using my tile nippers and I have no particular way that I'd like to do this. I have no particular way that I like to do this. I'm just going to go through and kind of chunk it almost randomly. Um, well, it's not random. I'm kind of just chunking it down into little bitty squares. definitely be sure to wear your safety glasses this is no joke and so from here I'm actually going to be using this empty bin to put my cut pieces into and so I'm going to cut this like that and these are coming out quite small compared to what I would do for tiles and so now I'm going to take these and I'm going to cut them in half. And I'm just going to continue processing down. And we can even do some into thirds, nice and small. And I'm trying to get a very, like, milk and honey looking blend out of this. So I'm going to continue processing this, and then I'll meet you guys back here when I finished probably just that little section we had done. So we have all of our well, a section of the glass processed into, on average, a centimeter, maybe a little bit larger than a centimeter square little pieces. And I'm going to be doing an experiment to see which one is my favorite. And I'd love it if um, y'all would let me know what your favorite is. If you're watching during the premiere, um, be sure to let me know over in the premiere chat. So I'm going to do the base in one side in clear the base in the center will be this amber transparent um medium amber transparent and that's in a fine grain and then a medium grain white opalescent let me see if i can't find a clear that is um a bit smaller grained than the coarse grain because i want it to like be a little bit of a bed 
for me to put the uh, the glass into. Oh, I got some iridized, but that's too big. What are you? Still coarse grain. Look at it. Still coarse grain. All right, let me find it. So this is how I store my frit is in these big drawers. Ah, the medium grain, that'll be perfect. So I have them like kind of by color and I absolutely love these drawers because you can fit a lot in them. Really nice, a lot of heavy stuff too. Now you could get real particular about weighing how much you're putting into each cell um, of your mold. Eh, I'm not gonna do that, but <laughs> you totally could though. So I'm doing about a quarter teaspoon of clear. Let's make it, let's see if we can't beef it up to about half a teaspoon of clear for each of these. There's that. I always put my lids back on because spilling this stuff is no fun. Now, there we are with a half teaspoon of the fine grain. Yeah, I think that'll be great. And again, this is going to give us a little bit of a footing, something to put the pieces that we've cut into. There we go. And now with the white. And we could do this with no footing. Um, but I really, in my experience in the past with working with molds, I really enjoy having a little bit of... Uh, smaller grained glass in the bottom of the mold to place other things into. So now I'm going to take this and just wiggle side to side. And I want to be very careful because I don't want any of what I'm doing to scrape. Um, like if I need to position things or move, like if I have this little bit of glass right here, I can just gently touch it with this very soft bristled brush but you don't want to be scraping the boron nitride into your piece. And you could use tweezers. I'm just going to use my fingers because those are what I've got on my hands right now. Um, and I'm going to come through and just position. Well, some of these came out maybe a little bit bigger than what I needed. So I'm just going to set them in up on their end. And if I have an option between an edge end or a side, I'm totally going to go with the side. I think I'm actually going to do whichever one will fit, honestly. And, and with this mold, you can kind of see it does have a narrower side and a wider side. And that's something to keep in mind whenever you're placing your glass is... um you know, kind of how everything's going to fit in together. And I'm just stacking these, not quite like dominoes. Once you have enough glass in your, in your mold, you can just kind of lean them up against each other. But I'm really interested just to see how this is going to come out. Because I've done something like this a while ago with, um, like a good while ago actually at the time of recording. Um, with doing like a herringbone inlay with like different pieces uh, and that, that came out really nice. That is definitely kind of at the core of this design. And what's really nice about using large pieces like this is, um, well, it does take a little bit of time here on the front end to get everything in and assembled. This is going to melt down really nicely. So, and I figured having one of each or two of each uh, would give us a nice sampling. So I'm going to finish loading these up in this exact same way. And then I'll meet you guys uh, for the next step. I've changed my mind. So we have across the top here, the way that I was showing you where we kind of stack it in on the edge. And then I'd like to go through and fill in the rest of 
the other three molds with the same base but with them turned um, with this interesting pattern that we were able to achieve during the initial sheet melt um, exposed towards the front. And then we will be capping this in clear, possibly. And just to see kind of two different effects with the exact same materials is always kind of interesting to me to be like, you know, uh, if I can do one sheet melt and then have it turn out a couple of different ways that's just really cool now my worry with what i'm doing right here is that it will look kind of blocky but that might turn out really nice so i'm not gonna diss it till i've tried it And these ones are what I will be capping with the coarse clear. And the coarse is just um, a like a denotation denotation. It just means how big the grit is. But there's no difference otherwise. It's the same COE, the same brand, which I'm using mostly as not spectrum. Um, Oceanside and Wismock, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, but I would not bet money on it. So just getting in some nice big chunky pieces. You can always cut something down a little bit more to size if needed. Is what I'm doing over here that way we can have a nice little square right there and where the there it is a nice little square Oop. right there you know and I'm gonna let that one be up on its end just cuz why not so now we're taking our coarse grain and these are full enough I don't think we're going to need the coarse grain on top and I'm just going to come through and sprinkle and then I'm going to expose the center and this is the way I've been doing it for a few years now but just because it's the way I've been doing it does not mean that it is the best way or that it isn't incorrect. So all y'all who are actual glass artists out there, because and I say that because while I work with glass a whole lot, I don't really consider myself a glass artist. I like making stuff out of glass to use in my other mediums, um, but I, I still feel like I don't really know what I'm doing. So uh, if, I, if you have a, an idea or a suggestion, I would love to hear it. And so now we will pop this into the kiln and I will show you how the kiln looks when it's fully loaded and then the firing schedule that we're going to be running is down in the video description um, but basically we're just going to ramp it nice and slow slow and steady up to uh, full fuse temperature with a little bit of um, a bubble squeeze in there to try to let any trapped air emerge from the glass and then we are going to anneal it uh, and I'm using 96 COE glass, but again, the same project you could do. Uh, I actually think it'd be really interesting to try this with some chunked pieces of my uh, soft glass, my soda glass, my 104 COE. Hmm. Uh, just kind of the, the rods of that kind of just clipped up into I don't know, we're gonna have to try further experimentation is required <laughs> but uh you can totally do this with if you use like bullseye 90 coe uh stuff you can do something very similar just adapt your firing schedule to suit what you're working with this is how the kiln is loaded you can see i'm riding real close to the edge there but i've done it before and things still worked out so hopefully it'll work out again because i am riding those edges but we have it up on an inch and then three half inch posts to allow for plenty of air circulation. 
and we have the top of this loaded on some papyrus brand kiln paper usually i use bullseye thin fire but uh when i was ordering more they were all out so papyrus it was and it's pretty good stuff it's stout for certain um cleans up just as easy as the thin fire though but we've got some dichros stacked some not dichro stacked and so we'll see how this comes out my beloved randy is going to close the kiln for me because i'm a too short excellent it is the following day and this is how the top layer has come out and melted down and i'm very very pleased with how that's looking it's kind of hard to catch the dichro uh when they're just sitting flat like this but let's i want to get to that bottom level okay so here from this angle you can see the dichro a good bit better just a touch of color i really like it and here are our donuts so we are going to go unmold them uh, and make some stuff so i'm really in love with the colors so this one is the clear background and that one is the medium honey or medium amber and this one is the white background i think <laughs> we'll have to take it out of the mold and i really like it stacked up on the edge those are some really beautiful designs babe come check these out have to turn it oh see interesting right let's get this unmolded and see what's up okay okay so this is how we unmold it we're gonna try anyway we're gonna try Hey, so all but one. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we'll wash them and then look at them. Because <laughs> they're all out of order now, too. That's fine. There we go. Sometimes they can be a little bit tricky to get out, but not in a little slap and can't fix. So we have cleaned up our cabochons in some hot soapy water with a nylon bristled scrub brush just to remove all the boron nitride uh, that tends to stick sometimes. Now, let's see if I can't lay these back out. Now it's very evident when you look at the backs what was, this was the clear backing. And the way that the molds work is they are not like the molds that I've used with resin, where whenever you pour it in, it's the mold, like the face of the mold uh, that you'd pop it out and that would be the front with these ones it's the butt of it <laughs> so you can see it has that nice fire polished surface so there's the clear with the chunks let me see if I can't zoom in just a bit now the only thing with the clear is it does pick up on the color behind it which is a cool opportunity to do a little color theory in with your wire wrapping and stuff see so this one is the clear with them set up on their edge and I have to say this is one of my favorites y'all look at those super cool cells let's see is that detrification yeah it's got a little bit we can grind that off and refire polish though and there's a lot of glass artists who would turn their nose up at me. I just leave it like that. It makes it look organic. I'm not a perfectionist, and I don't feel like charging an arm and a leg for my work. Um, I do just, you know, try to be evident about um, whenever there are flaws with my work, I will point them out to the customer. But more often than not, those little flaws and pieces of character is what makes them fall in love with the piece. But hot dog that is a pretty melt like this is probably I feel in my heart one of the most beautiful pieces of glass I've ever made I love the banding the speckling that floated up from the initial sheet melt like that's that's a huge deal to me okay and then in the center row we had had the medium amber and y'all, again, that is so pretty. <laughs> so here you can see how it looks on the back. It has that dark deposit of color. And that was a translucent amber. And I just, I, I think that one looks really pretty too. Like, I think this is my new favorite technique. 
Oh, it's a, it's a load of work, though. I'm not going to lie to you, but gosh, that's pretty. And then this is the one with the chunks. Yeah, and I, I do like that pretty well also. It's pretty, but it's hard to beat that. Stacking them on the edge to get that kind of wild variation. And then we've got our pieces that were backed with white. And again, I think this one may be one of my favorite, like just this style in general. I mean, it almost makes it look like an agate or an onyx or like acrylic pour. Like, <laughs> just, I don't know. Like, it's so pretty though. I love it. I want to try this in literally every single color ever. So we're going to have to test that out. But check this one out with the white on the background as well. I think I do like that one maybe a little better than the clear. Though really, I want to know which one is y'all's favorite. One, two, three, four, five, or six. So let me know in the comments which one is your favorite. And now I'm going to show y'all a couple of different ways of wrapping these. Now, the whole point of doing these, I wanted to make some honeybee necklaces. Um, so I have these really cute bee charms and I'm just looking for making sure that it has a little hole there in like between the wing and the leg on each side and I'm going to be using ball head pins in a matching color scheme and you can do this uh, technique with any charm like a steampunk gear would be like very very cool looking um, some different mandalas or like really whatever like you and they also make really great bases for wire wrapping also so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take our ball pin and see if we can wiggle it into not quite on that one. In today's episode of Will It Fit? It won't. What a surprise. <laughs> now, if you're having that trouble pretty consistently, you can come in with a diamond awl. And open it up just a little bit. And you're not really going to be able to see um, if you're worried about scraping off any of the enamel or anything like that. I don't think you're really going to have to worry about it because once the ball pin is in there, it covers up any sort of removed enamel. And so those just sit in like that. You could use flat head pins, but I do prefer the look of the ball pin. And so let's do, let's do this one. So, so pretty. So I'm just going to thread both of those head pins through here. And I have covered this in a tutorial before, but it was, it was a while ago. So, um, and now I want to come around and bend through the loop here. So I am going to be using my bent nose pliers to just encourage that wire around and we want to make sure that it's wrapping this part right here I want to stay in the center so I'm going to keep my wire exiting off to the right and there's one and now we can actually flip this around keeping things nice and snug but don't be too heavy-handed with it because sometimes I'll accidentally rip off um, my loop there which gets kind of tricky and now, again, keeping that end off to the right. And I'm just using my finger to push as I pull, just to encourage it down until it's parallel to the one next to it. And then do one more loop. And all the tools and materials that I'm using will be down in the video description below. And those are affiliate links, so purchasing through them um, really help support our channel at no additional cost to you because we are Amazon affiliates 
and uh, it's just a, it's a great way to I think just get you all started shopping because even if you look at what's in the link and you, whoop, <laughs> my pliers slipped that's all right though but if you're looking in the link and um, you're like you know I like this but it's you know it's not quite perfect it still it lets you see exactly how much I paid the specs of what I'm using everything and it's just a nice I, I find it helpful when other people post them because it helps me get started shopping I do like a little bit of movement there and now we're gonna come in with our wire snips and give it a snip and give it a snip let's do the old squish and smoosh I'm just tucking in that end to make sure that it's not going to potentially snag on anything. I like to do my cuts where the wire is kind of between all the pieces. So you'd really have to get in there to uh, make that wire poke you. And then I just squished them together. And from here, we could attach a ring and a bail. Or we could, let's pretend for a moment that this is like beading wire. Um, like tiger tail or something and we're stringing beads and then we would just string this right along with that or you could just feed the chain directly through right there um, so that is one way of doing this now let's say you don't have any ball pins or head pins you just have some well this is some 26 gauge wire so let's use that and I'm going to cut a 12 inch section just because, why not? This is some scrap wire that I had, quite a bit of scrap scrap wire that I had left over from a previous project. So I'm gonna come through now, and what we're going to do here is I'm going to fold my wire in half, and this is vintage bronze toned para wire in their 26 gauge round. And I'm going to just feed this through from the back on our little bee charm. And I'm going to pull through until it nestles up nice and snug. And you can push it with your fingernail, do whatever you want to do to get that to be very nice and snug. And then from here, I'm going to wrap. Do you see how it nestled quite perfectly just right there between the wing and the leg in the design? I'm going to do that on both sides and now we've accomplished the same thing that having a header ball pin would do and that is we have secured our wire to our charm and now we're just going to thread both of these ends through like this and we're going to come up and I am going to now since this is 26 gauge wire there's not really a whole lot of substance there <clears throat> so I'm going to want to double, triple, quadruple up if I can. So I've threaded through the center, but instead of wrapping it and binding it off the way we did with the head pins, I'm actually going to just come down back and through. And I want to, just like the wire is a needle, as though I am sewing on a button, sort of, a very cute little button. Will you even fit? Let us see. I want to try to get it back through that same hole. Uh, maybe that's just a one wire hole. Harumph. Well, this is a perfect opportunity. Now, since we have already threaded wire through, um, doing this again, I feel like would wear down that initial wire like if we were to use the awl on this so I'm going to use a porcupine quill you could use a t-pin or whatever you have to actually whoops lift up that wire across the back of the bee's abdomen on the charm and I'm gonna put just a little hook here on the tip of the wire And I'm going to hook through, and I'd prefer to hook through from top to bottom. That way it's a little easier for me to get my pliers in there, but it doesn't quite look like it's going to work that way. So 
So I'm just going to reach in with my bent nose pliers. I actually have a pair of very fine tipped bent, no pl bent nose pliers for moments like this. And I'm just going to get in there and grab the tip of that wire. Ooh, come on, we can do it. And pull it through. There we go. And we will just pull that down. So now we don't just have one length of the 26 gauge wire holding on, we have two of them on that side. So three total. So I'm going to do this on the other side and that will give us four total. And I think that that'll be all right. So by doing that little bit of a bend first, let's see if I can't ultra zoom in for you guys. By doing that little bit of a bend first, you can kind of see right there where the tip of the wire protrudes up. And that just gives me something to grab onto that we can then pull through, like pulling a needle and thread. And this can look a little messier, that's okay. Sometimes on pieces like this, I like to just throw caution to the wind and make it very chaotic and organic and, you know, however you like to call it. And so now I'm going to come back up and I'm going to hook through the top here again. That top loop. And if you want to tidy this up to make it look a little less like a chaotic jumble, I am going to thread this right side wire through to the left so that both of our wires are off to one side. And I'm just going to start whip stitching this around so that it's binding all of our lengths of 26 gauge wire together to make it like one wrapped rope sort of. So if you're able to see how I'm doing that. And since I'm doing the two pieces side by side, it's not going to be perfect. Um, like it's going to be a lot more jumbled over itself and twisted and, you know, it might not be perfectly coiled, but this is really doing a lot to make this connection point substantial. So I'm going to zoom back out so that I, I'm always afraid of wandering out of frame and never coming back. <laughs> like, it's, well, it is what it is. And so I think just doing that bit will be perfect. And then I'm going to finish the wire off by just doing a, sn whoop, a snip quite close. There we are. So the old snip and smush. Smush, smush, smush. Making sure that there's no little pokey bits. And snipping off the wire in a place where you can make sure that whenever it's bound, like when it's smushed like this, that the wire ends, again, are kind of between the, whether it's glass or gemstone, because this works perfectly well on um, gemstone donuts as well, or even resin ones. So I would watch out for resin scratches really easily. So there is that. And just real quick, let's throw together a bale. I'm going to be using 16 gauge para wire. This is copper cord. Um, where is the end of my wire? Uh, maybe if we go like that. Nope, there it is. So I just measure with my hand, I've said it before, but I'll say it again because I usually have them on me. Sorry, I don't get out much and I think I'm funny, <laughs> but uh, about that much and I am going to measure it. So three inches of wire and then I'm going to use my mandrel pliers to through the magic of editing, and now I have a clean work surface. <laughs> now nah, I'm not really going to edit that. I'm going to use the smallest tip of my mandrel pliers 
to make a little loop just like that and then I'm going to move up to the eight millimeter barrel and you could use a pen or paintbrush or knitting needles or whatever you have on hand and I'm going to bend around using my pliers to get in there to smush and I want this wire to end up being in line like it's going to track back around with that circle and now I'm going to hold on to the other side and let's bend that around and again you can totally use your pliers to tuck that little tip around. I'm going to use my wire snips to get in here and snip quite flush with like I want the end of the wire to line up with the inside of this wire here. So I realize now that vintage bronze in this lighting is not the best color to be using but hopefully that demonstrates to you what we just did there. And now we can split this open. So I'm trying to not have my fingers be in the way. I'm just gonna split that open and that gives us enough of an opening here and we can lift this side out. So it's kind of like putting a key ring on. I'm just gonna hook through and travel around. Oh, I guess I need it turned a little further. <laughs> okay, so if I were to attach it this way, I would need to do a ring between the pendant and the, um, the bail. Or we could just get fancy. I'm going to insert my mandrel pliers And I am going to turn this just a little deeper to make it be perpendicular to how it was positioned. And you can see that distorted our wire a little higher up, but it's nothing that we can't fix with just a little bit of a smush and a tuck. And again, I'm kind of opening everything up so that we can do like a key ring and hook through right there bring it around town and sometimes you really gotta open everything up <laughs> like crazy and the pendant is almost in its own way with this so I'm going to open that end up. I mean, this doesn't even look like a bale anymore. Sometimes that's what you got to do to get it to, boom, land where it's supposed to go. And then if you just remember where the loops are supposed to be, you can close that loop down, close that loop down, and bring them back together. And so it probably would have been easier to just use a loop to connect, but I wanted to give you guys options. And I'll show you how to do the bail a second time um, on the other pendant using a ring to connect. And this one kind of shifted off to the side, so we can actually just take our pliers and encourage that over. Maybe. Yep, there we go. Oh, out of frame. But just keeping that centered, those wires, will help keep our pendant, our bail centered, which will help keep our pendant centered. And so this is something that I would just string a chain through and then sell out of my booth or on my website. So we're going to zoom it out again and then back in just a hair. Oops, 
and then oh, thank goodness I don't spill those beads and then I'm going to snip off another three inches of wire same as before and I'm going to be using this drives some people absolutely bananas but if you don't like it do it different on your project I love mixing metal tones like an absolute barbarian um <laughs> so I'm going to be using these silver toned um aluminum rings to join our bale together and they are 18 gauge 1 8 inch or 1.2 millimeter by it doesn't say across the top well good luck <laughs> this well that's one of the older ones they said it here it is here's my newer one yeah so 1.2 mil by 3.2 mil is the size of ring that I like to use for my jump rings more often than not okay so I'm gonna bring this around and I want this being bumped in a way that the ends line up as much as possible. So if you have a longer end, that's the one that I bend around so that material gets used up first. And then we're going to hold right here and we're going to bend this around. And practice will make for progress, guys. You'll figure this out. It may feel clumsy and awkward at first, but that's just how it goes. You have to crawl and stumble before you learn to walk. Whoops. Ooh, my knuckle. <laughs> but that's okay. My re my advice, if you're just starting out and if you're frustrated with this, is that it's okay to take a break and come back to it. But please enjoy these beginning, these first steps in your uh, crafting journey. Because through practice does come progress. And with any sort of luck at all, we'll never be this bad at this again. So, because I have to tell y'all, I'm, I can be pretty bad at making jewelry a lot of the time, actually. And that's okay, because I love making it. Okay, so since we're joining it together with rings, um, we don't have to do that splitting process first. So I'm going to just tuck these ends close in together. Like that. And I think that makes just a beautiful little ba little bale. And then I'm going to use my flat nose pliers to hold it. Mm, no, I will use my nylon jaw pliers to hold it because they hold just a little better. And then this is where I use my flat nose to just kind of get in between and bend this wire off to the side just a smidge and it's going to give it like a fancy smancy like ooh, look at that um effect uh -huh, so fancy <laughs> and now i rummage through my pile of pliers and we're going to open up that jump ring hook it through right here and then hook it through our bale and close it and you could just use one jump ring but I really think it makes it look more substantial and lay a little more purposefully whenever you do two jump rings and so that is how to make these pendants from the glass up <laughs> so I guess next time we'll uh, the only way to go deeper into this would be to start fabricating our own charms. So maybe next time we'll tackle that as well. But this is it, y'all. I do hope this tutorial was helpful to you. Uh, if you're here in the premiere chat, hey, everybody, thank you so much for joining me today. If you wanted to be here during the premiere and didn't get the notification, be sure to be sure to sign up for our um, free newsletter. Uh, you get notifications of every time we have a new tutorial or a live stream or shop update and you also get a super juicy 15% off coupon uh, be sure to like let me know 
um, which one of these, like which one of the cabs that you liked, or the donuts, I suppose. Um, because again, I really think this one's my favorite. Just, oh my gosh, that patterning. Mm. Okay. Uh, and then also, ooh, if you enjoy the channel and would like to support beyond just liking and subscribing and tickling all of my buttons and stuff, um, you can feel free to join our Happy Crafter Club. It starts at just a dollar a month, and we also do like booty boxes and stuff, but all that information is down in the video description, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank you guys just for being here, for taking some time out of your day to get crafty with me, and I will see y'all next time. So until then, happy crafting. Mwah. Bye. <laughs>